Um, welcome. So I enjoyed the paper, um, and I think uh, you know Professor Foster is right that uh, the third model is what we should be uh, looking at: this cooperative resource management. And so I was going to talk specifically about that model and elaborate on what uh, she said, and uh, draw some parallels. I think there are a lot of parallels between the environmental law movement and the uh, intellectual property law movement. I'll talk about some of those, and I've written a little bit about that, and other people have written about it. So wh when do cooperative research ma resource management uh, schemes work? Um, I think Professor Foster is right that they're not uh, endogenous. They don't just sort of spontaneously emerge. They, they sometimes can spontaneously emerge, especially with, you know, it would be interesting to see the role of sort of social, you know, social network sites and things like that, as far as whether they, there is spontaneity. I think about the what are, what are those called? I forget what they're called. Are they flash mobs? Is there sort of a flash mob phenomenon to this? But but you're right that the law has to foster it, or other types of institutions have to foster it. And the, one of the things that's really appealing about cooperative resource management is that it allows us to re recognize their, that there are other institutions beyond just markets and the state. So we're sort of caught, I guess what I would describe as sort of a Cold War mentality, that it's either one or the other. Uh, when in fact there are mon many institutions. But when do those institutions work? They seem to work, and again, this is more um, impressionistic, and the Professor Foster can correct me. They seem to have to have some degree of homogeneity. Just looking back at some of Eleanor Ostrom's work, so they tend to have to be small, I guess, in scale, homogeneity, some sense of common interest. I guess the information costs have to be fairly low. Um, to, you know, ways to get around hold-up problems. So I, I'm, I'm not. Sh so we have to be careful about when these institutional arrangements work, but also be aware that they are alternative arrangements. So, with that in mind, how does this then? How do we translate or compare and contrast what goes on in the uh, environmental context and in the intellectual property context? So the first thing I think is, uh, I think maybe the main thing throughout my comments is sort of one of how you conceptualize it. Uh, Jamie Boyle is an intellectual property scholar who's written about how environmental notions, and one of the things he points out is the very concept of an environment is something that, you know, we sort of take that for granted, but if you just simply view pollution as like a private cost or something that you just impose on another private individual, rather than recognizing that there is such a thing as an environment that we all share, that really does affect the nature of the law. So once you recognize that, there is such a thing as an environment that affects us all, then you sort of have a stake in uh, you know, whether there's air pollution in Los Angeles, even if you never live in Los Angeles, right, because it's the broader environment. So I, I mean, I, this again impressionistic, I wonder if that's part of the, re part of the resistance to the global warning, warming phenomenon, obviously is just ignorance, but part of it may be conceptual in terms of uh, can we understand, Barry can understand whether next week, how do we understand it over tens of thousands of years? So there may be, there's that conceptual blockage, but there's also kind of this notion, like a really silly notion, like, well, what's wrong with global warming uh, that helps Sweden, right? I mean, uh, that becomes now more of a trap. I mean, I've heard this in not just simply trivial. So there is this conceptual blockage. So the question then for intellectual property is what's the, uh, the analogy to the environment with it? So you know, a lot of intellectual property activists have said public domain, but that doesn't really work because public domain sometimes just simply means the absence of law. It doesn't really explain why there is the law. It just often means it's just an absence. So you have other things like uh, perhaps knowledge, like we're talking about today, that something knowledge is something that we all share, much like we all share the environment. And so we have a individual commitment to knowledge, and that then explains why we recognize their IP rights, but there also might be limits to IP rights if you want to have access or use of knowledge. And that can work, except knowledge tends to be this very arcane you know, amorphous type thing. What kind of knowledge? I mean, do I really care about genetic knowledge if I'm not in that field? So sometimes IP then can readily uh, break down into sort of industry, right? So the, the collectivity is not so much a broader collectivity. It's, you know, the software industry cares about certain issues in the biotech. And, and so that's often how many of the debates in IP break down by industry rather than recognizing there's a common uh, set of interests, like, like with the environment. I don't think the environmental industry necessarily breaks. I mean, the coal industry, obviously, and there's all, but there's this notion of an environment that transcends all that. We don't necessarily have that in intellectual property. So maybe it's culture. So maybe culture is the analogy to the environment. But then again, culture becomes very, you know, laden. Is it nationalistic culture? Is it international culture? Is it regional culture? 
And so that is one of the problems, I think, in sort of bridging these cooperative resource management issues from environmental law into intellectual property law. What's the kind of the, the, the wampeter, to, to quote uh, Kurt Vonnegut, that we all care about? What is the, you know, what is the, uh, uh, the conceptual sort of uh, 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 aspect that we all have some sort of a stake in? Okay, so this sounds a little harsh. I think there is a way to, but that's, I think, one of the things that permeates our discussion is what is this, uh, what is this uh, you know, common bond or common interest? So the next issue that I think is also conceptual is how do you, you know, is the kind of the relationship between negative and positive externalities, right? So you talk about negative externalities, and when you think about property rights solution, going back to uh, economists like Ronald Coase, they talk about property rights because we assign the property rights to deal with the negative externality because if you can assign the property rights correctly, then the, the cost gets internalized, right? So that's usually the argument for um, you know, some sort of property rights solution. Does that translate that readily into, how does it translate into intellectual? So the simple-minded translation is, well, if you want people to internalize all the costs, then in the intellectual property system, you're often talking about positive externalities. That, you know, I create something, I have a song that benefits people. So by analogy in the coast, and then we should have the creator internalize all the positive externalities. So that's what uh, myself and other people have written to suggest that intellectual property has this upward ratchet, that you should have very broad, okay, sure. You have very broad property rights in order to ex internalize all the benefits as an analogy to internalizing all the costs. Uh, but that has problems of its own. So, for example, if you have uh, every song, let's say, having broad property rights, that can potentially create, uh, as I was talking with somebody at lunch, an anti-commons problem. There are too many property rights. And so if I want to negotiate to make a movie that has all these songs, I have to then nego rather than sort of making some argument or limitation on fair use or licensing or something like that. So the analogy then between environmental law and um, and uh, intellectual property law can be problematic if you go too literally in some ways from the negative to the positive externality. So one way to go back is actually to read Coase, right? Rather than read people who claim to have read Coase, read Coase. Coase wasn't necessarily talking directly about, he was talking about the model is conflicting use. So it's not so much that somebody who's polluting or you know, having the, the smokestack is causing a harm to let's say the farmer, his point was it's just as easy to say that the farmer is causing harm to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, the alleged polluter or the smokes. I mean, that sounds a little bit like calling ketchup a vegetable or something. It's this sort of this postmodern twist, which again can be dangerous. But his point is just a conflicting use problem. And so I think that's an, a relevant model for uh, IP. We often think about IP in terms of a trespass model but really it's a nuisance model in the sense that you know, I have a particular use that I want for this artifact or this particular piece of scientific knowledge, uh, but then other people might have other uses. And so how do you negotiate that conflicting use? And I think there, maybe some of the work in environmental law uh, can come into play, at least as analogs, and, and, and vice versa. It's a two-way street in terms of how you, how you negotiate that use. So it's not just simply then a pure kind of economic question or a legal question of rights. It becomes then also a political question right, in terms of how you, you deal with those types of conflicting uses. So my last, last point, I guess, I don't know if this is two points or one, I haven't written down as two, is again a conceptual question. So this is another thing that I've uh, toyed with in stuff of writing. So you described the commons as a, sort of a, collect, a collectivity where, where no one owns resources. See, I, I would pull it down and say maybe everybody owns resources. I mean, this is sort of this question about a larger, what do you, no, I understand, I understand, but the, but the point is what do you mean by own? Right, I mean that, so own obviously has the legal sense of right to exclude, but it also has a cultural or social sense, and it could have a legal sense that doesn't necessarily mean right to exclude. Right, it could mean that you own it in the sense that you have some sort of a stake in it. And that may blend the legal and the political, but that would also be a, a notion of ownership that I think is worth recognizing. So, uh, and I, I, I'm just kind of not quibbling, I'm just sort of, you know, so, so for example, Michael Brown wrote, you know, who owns native culture, and I think your colleague Susan Scafidi had wrote a book called Who Owns Culture? And so I've, I wrote a short review where I said, who doesn't own culture? In, in the sense that it may not be that everybody has a right to exclude, but ownership also has a, this dimension of having a stake in something. And so this goes back in some ways to my first point that maybe culture is this thing that we, you know, but the problem of course there is at national, regional, you know, how are you defining it? So um, this is related then to, I think the question you asked me a little bit uh, 
during one of our many coffee breaks um, about justice. How do you incorporate the justice notion? So I think this gets into, you know, once you understand that there is this kind of common bond that we all share, then how do you sort of, you know, uh, implement? What are the institutions that implement that? So the basic notion, of course, there's some notion of reciprocity, right? So in the environmental area, we might disagree over how to use it, but we can sort of find some sort of balance or compromise. So the market system involves certain types of reciprocity that may or not work, but I think we have to sort of understand where there is this kind of interest convergence or some degree of reciprocity. And I think that does involve understanding this kind of shared notion of what's at stake and also kind of figuring out how to negotiate in that space. So that, that's my comments.